So now I am going to introduce to you uh, Brother Guy Consol Magno, who is the director of the Vatican Observatory, and we are extremely fortunate that, that he's agreed to talk to our small club tonight. He's not, in fact, a stranger to our club. Here's a photo taken in uh, April 2019. You can see Brother Guy at the, at the front. And the motley crew surrounding him are a group of Corpus Astronomy Club members who visited the Vatican Observatory in, in uh, Castel uh, Gandolfo last year. It seems ages ago, but it was only actually 18 months ago. Uh, Brother Guy uh, was our host on that occasion and went out of his way to make us all extremely welcome. And uh, we were delighted to make his acquaintance on that occasion and we're delighted to renew it tonight. Brother Guy is a specialist in planetary science and an expert in on meteorites. He's taught at Harvard, MIT, Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, where he was an assistant professor. From this, you can see how fortunate we are to be able to welcome him to our club tonight. And he's joining us from uh, Tucson, Arizona, where he gave talks to the Vatican Observatory Foundation earlier in the year and is confined there now due to the virus. So, uh, Corpus Astronomy Club is delighted that Brother Guy has agreed to join us tonight, or for him, the afternoon. And uh, I forgot to mention his most significant qualification. He has uh, family connections in County Cork. Brother Guy, uh, over to you. All right. Thanks a whole lot for having me here. I'm delighted to be able to share this talk. It's an interesting sort of talk because it started out as a hybrid Somebody had wanted me to give a talk on Galileo and someone else in that group said, no, 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 let's talk about the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si. And so I wound up putting a talk that was both together. And I think it works. But what I want to talk about is a bit of our history. And I'm going to be talking about the role of the Catholic Church. I'm the director of the Vatican Observatory, so I'm a representative of the church. Not to defend it, not to attack it just to explain how it has changed over the years. Because I find it interesting as, you know, why do we even have a Vatican Observatory? It goes back to the history of how the church got involved in astronomy in the first place. And the beginnings really are with the medieval university. And you have to remember that the universities were founded by the church to educate clergy and eventually to educate the rising middle and upper class and there were two sets of courses you had to take before you could go on and get your doctorate. The trivial courses, the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. We sometimes call that grammar school now. It's where you learn how to speak and how to present your arguments. The quadrivium would be the four courses, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. These were topics that educated people thought they ought to know. Astronomy is one of them. Astronomy in those days was cosmology, how the universe was put together, because that felt that it fit into not only philosophy, but also theology. And then in the medieval universities, eventually you were going to either study theology or philosophy. Uh, of course, our universities today cover many, many more topics. And yet, my degree is still PhD, Doctor of Philosophy. And at the end of the, uh, the course, I dress up in a long black robe and put on a, a, you know, a clerical hat from the Middle Ages and get my sheepskin. Again, it's you know, something that dates from the Middle Ages. Our universities start. Well, that means that by the time you get to Galileo, <clears throat> you already have a tradition of the church educating people in astronomy. There was also the practical reason. Gregory the 13th needed to reform the calendar. The church's calendar was based on both the Roman calendar, which was a seasonal calendar, an annual calendar, and the Hebrew calendar, because a number of the feasts, you know, Easter was the Sunday after Passover. Passover is the first full new moon of spring. So you've got to know when the spring, you've got to know where the moon is, you've got to know when Sunday's going to be. The Gregorian calendar actually fudged that by coming up with a formula that gets it right 17 years out of 18, but it was a neat, relatively easy formula to work out. Nonetheless, they had hired astronomers. This is in the 1580s. When Galileo came along 
in the early 1600s, he was, of course, speaking to the church. Well, here's a question. Everybody knows, you know, the Galileo had a problem with the church. Why was the church even interested? There were two things. Number one, the church was the academy. The church was the organization that was figuring out what is worth teaching and what is worth not teaching. As, you know, Carl Sagan himself once put it, and I guess today it would have been his 80-somethingth birthday. Um, as he said, you know, they, they, they <clears throat> laughed at Newton and they laughed at Einstein, but they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. How do you know just because somebody's laughing at you that you're not Bozo the Clown? Today, we have a system of deciding whether or not, not whether or not a scientific idea is true, but whether it's even worth thinking about. But Galileo is more than that. I have here, you know, a couple of famous media stars, Carl Sagan being one of them. And um, <clears throat> the other guy is a famous British media star, and I've already forgotten his name, that's how famous he is, doesn't matter. Too many kids today don't remember Carl Sagan either. Galileo was of that sort because he was not only a great astronomer, he was a guy who actually never got his degree. He dropped out of school before getting uh, his, he was actually originally starting to study medicine and he hated doing medicine. But he made his living selling books. To get a sense of what the, the relationship between Galileo and the church was, you have to know a little bit about Galileo. And I think the best way is simply to look at the dates of the Galileo affair. So here are all the, all the different things that go on, key dates. Rather than looking at those years, go as if you're looking 400 years later. It's the year 2020. And there is this prominent astronomer, Galileo, who's got a very controversial book. And people are deciding whether or not uh, these ideas of Copernicus, well, that was exactly 400 years ago. Who is this Galileo who's at the center of all this attention? He's somebody who was born in 1964. You guys know people born in 1964. So imagine somebody who's, you know, pushing 60 years old. He's not a kid. And the theory that they're talking about had been proposed back during World War II. That's how old that theory is. These were not new and radical ideas. And Galileo still won't actually go on to trial for another 13 years when he's nearly 70. Galileo was not some radical genius, you know, some person from the 21st century who was you know, thrown back into time. He was a person of his time. He was a person who was well known. He was a person who loved um, controversy because that sold books and that's how we made his living. Galileo's dad, by the way, was, was the equivalent of a rock star. He was a traveling musician. And so Galileo knew all about publicity. He also, his dad was, you know, 40 years old when he was born and he was the eldest of five kids. So dad was long gone. He was the one who had to come up with the, the dowries for his sister, the money to get his brother launched into society. That's why he was always broke, which is why he had to keep selling the books. The key thing that Galileo did that everybody remembers is he came up with the telescope. He didn't invent it. He didn't even totally understand how it worked. He was working outside of Venice in Padua, which was the university town. A buddy of his heard about this invention where you have two lenses and you can look through them, told Galileo how to make it. Galileo was able to make good telescopes because he could make good lenses because he was in Venice that had the best glass in Europe at the time. And the telescope you can see is you know, barely an inch in aperture. But Galileo was something else. He was more than just a guy who knew how to make telescopes. He had also been trained in literature, which meant he was a fabulous writer, and in art. He was not the first person to see the moon through a telescope. Thomas Harriet did that. But you can see the drawing here that Thomas Harriet made, which is you know, almost a, a children's scrawl, compared with the watercolors that Galileo made which makes the moon look like a planet. And you can recognize the craters and you can recognize some of the features that we now know are there. Galileo was not only someone who did the science, he was someone who knew how to sell the science. And 
who was always looking for a way to be controversial to sell more things. I'm not going to turn this into an entire hour-long talk on Galileo. Yeah, I don't have the time for that. Three things that just three myths I want to blow up. First of all, he was not you know, an atheist. He was not somebody who was against the church. When he could have gone to the Protestant North, he didn't. He had two daughters. They both became nuns. He was a Catholic, proud to be a Catholic, proud to be an Italian. He was not convicted of being a heretic. The trial was about, you know, did he obey or disobey certain things that they'd asked him to do 30 years earlier? And frankly, he had disobeyed. It's pretty obvious. They got him on a technicality. Um, the final, when, when they, they came up with a trial in, in 1633, the final verdict, he said, well, we found you guilty of heresy. And he said, no, you haven't. There's nothing heretical that you found. You know, they, so they changed it to, he was guilty of vehement suspicion of heresy. And at that point, he had to stand before the court and say, I reject anything in my writing that is contrary to the teaching of the church, without ever specifying what those things might be. Very Jesuitical, if nothing else. And the third thing to remember is that everybody agrees the church was wrong to go after Galileo, whatever the reasons were, and nobody agrees on what the reasons were. Because the history is very clouded, it was a very complicated time. A number of historians over the years have come up with uh, possible reasons. Some, some phrase, well, it was just a, a conflict of worldviews. Or, oh, he believed in atoms. Well, actually, the guy who did finally come up with the atomic theory was a Jesuit priest. He made personal enemies. Of course, he made personal enemies. That's how he sold books. What can I say? He was an Italian. That's what you do. The philosophers were out to get him. The Jesuits were out to get him. Well, of course he had enemies. His book personally insulted the Pope, except that the Pope's, you know, censor had agreed to, to let it be published two years before the Pope suddenly decided, nope, nope, I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm shocked, shocked to find what's in this book. One thing that, that I find interesting is that all of these trials occurred during the height of the Thirty Years' War, and the Pope was under a lot of political pressures. But to draw the connection from there to why Galileo is really complicated, um, I talk about it in in this book. Would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Uh, which you know, it's such a good such a good book. You should buy two copies. There's a chapter there about Galileo, and the answer is anybody who thinks they want to tell you that they know why Galileo got in trouble, it's not so clear. What is clear is that the church had an interest in what Galileo was saying. And there was an interest because astronomy was what underpinned the philosophy that underpinned the theology that was being taught at the time. So there was this direct connection, but there was also a reason because the church was the academy. There weren't journals, there weren't editors, there weren't referees. And anybody who read Galileo's arguments as to whether the earth or the sun was moving recognized that his proofs didn't work. His biggest proof is to show that, ah, oh, the tides in the earth is proof that the earth spins. No, it isn't. For one thing, he got it wrong. He thought there was only one tide a day instead of two. If you read his arguments behind the tides, they don't work. They're wrong. Well, you need Newton's physics, which hadn't been around yet, to come up with why they're wrong, but they are wrong. The second proof was, well, if the earth is going around the sun, you ought to be able to see the sh stars shifting. And he says, oh, it's just a matter of time with the telescope, we're going to see that. All you need is a really bright star next to a really faint star. The bright star will be bright because it's close, the faint star because it's distant. And so you'll see a parallax motion, and the one will move contra, you know, relative to the other as the Earth moves. Good science, except he thought the stars were a lot closer to us than they really are because he saw a disk of a star in the telescope and didn't understand that that's just, you know, the the uh, diffraction circle of the telescope, because his telescope lens was very small. And not only that, he actually did see uh, Mizar and split it as a double star, bright star and faint star next to each other. He observed it for a year. He saw no parallax, and therefore, he didn't publish. And it was another 20 years where somebody else noticed it. The bigger thing, though, that happens with Galileo, beyond the telescope, beyond the discoveries, Galileo, with the telescope, sees something that nobody had ever seen before. And this shifts how people thought of the universe itself. 
it changed the mentality of was there a golden age in the past? It changed the mentality of can any philosopher with a pair of eyes see what I see? It changed the idea of what counts as a demonstration, as a proof. Now think of this. If you live in Rome, like I do, you see the ruins of the Roman civilization all around you. When I take the train from Castel Gandolfo into Rome, you can see the aqueducts. The aqueducts have been there 2,000 years. You know, if you asked me to build an aqueduct without hiring somebody with machinery to do it, I wouldn't know how to do that. How do you pile the stones up? I'm not a mason. The people in Rome from the fall of the Roman Empire until the time of Galileo were surrounded by evidence that things used to be really good here. We don't know how to do that anymore. But what do you expect? Things were better in the past. The people in the past knew things that we don't. The past was always better. The old idea was knowledge gradually fades over the centuries because things are always going from, you know, we started out in the Garden of Eden and now things are terrible. Or we started out with Atlantis in the, in the Mediterranean and they were the, the pinnacle of civilization. And you ask anybody with gray hair like me, and let me tell you, the music was a whole lot better 60 years ago than it is now. These kids don't know. Well, that's how people used to think. Incidentally, the new idea that has captured our, our senses, ah, everybody in the past was an ignorant savage, but slowly, you know, day by day, step by step, we're getting smarter and we're getting better, and science is going to lead us to perfection. Uh, yeah, both ideas are false. But it's the sense that, you know, everybody in the past was stupid that gives us, you know, the craziness of ancient astronauts. How could people have built the pyramids? And therefore, there must have been the ancient astronauts who did. Who taught the ancient astronauts? We won't ask. <clears throat> The second change was that Galileo used a tool. You needed a telescope to be able to see what Galileo saw. And there's a funny story when he was, you know, early on, he had gone from Padua where he had the telescope and made the discoveries down to his hometown of Florence to see if he could get a job, which he got. And on the way back, he stops off in Bologna and he's got this telescope, which is very long, really narrow field of view. He wants to show it off to people. And he doesn't have a good tripod and he can't find the moon and he can't find that star and it's out of anybody here who's tried showing somebody something through your telescope, you know exactly the panic you go through when it just isn't working. And somebody who was there watching Galileo be embarrassed wrote an article about what a fake and a fraud Galileo was. More to the point, if you're trying to convince people on the basis of what you saw through a telescope, You've got to have a lot of telescopes and a lot of people don't know how to use them or else they're not going to believe you. For the first time, science depended on a tool that not every philosopher was going to be able to use. That was a change in how science was done. And third, philosophers thought that they could prove things with logic. Galileo assumed he was a philosopher, a mathematical philosopher. Mathematics proves things, therefore I've proved things. Cardinal Bellarmine was, you know, you haven't actually proved that the earth is moving until I see a proof. I'm not going to assume that 1500 years of science is wrong. We know today that science doesn't prove. It comes up with a good description. It makes probable arguments. This is the most likely explanation for what we see. But if I'm really good, my students are gonna come along with a theory better than mine because science doesn't quit. If science were ever had things perfectly, then I couldn't ask for a grant next year to do more science. That change had not yet occurred at the time of Galileo. Therefore, Galileo was grasping for things he thought were proofs, rather than being able to say, this explanation is more likely than that explanation, but in 100 years time, who knows where we'll be. It also meant a change in how he expected the universe to work. Let's say every morning you go out to get the milk, you open the door, the milkman comes out, and I have milkman, the newspaper comes, whatever you go to the door every morning for, and there's a cat waiting there. So you put out a little bowl of milk for the cat, the next day the cat's there again, the next day the cat's there again. If someday the cat doesn't show up, you go, well, those are cats. You don't think that it's a violation of the laws of nature. In the medieval view of the universe, the universe was like a living animal. It did what it wanted to do. And just because it didn't work today, maybe it'll work again tomorrow. After Newton, who of course bases his ideas on Kepler, who bases his ideas on Galileo, 
after Newton, the universe is seen as a machine. And if it doesn't work the same way every way, every time, then it's broken. And I want to know why. And if I have an idea and I observe something that doesn't fit the idea, then I throw away the idea rather than saying, well, nature's like that. Newton's laws changed the way we looked at nature. The other thing that happened with Newton is he started publishing in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Suddenly it was no longer the people running the universities or the church that was the gatekeeper of this is worthwhile knowledge, this is nonsense. Now you would publish it, and if it was questionable, then people could argue in the next edition that, wait a minute, I don't think he got this right. We see that now with you know, the whole dispute of was there phosphine on Venus? Somebody had the observation, they sent it to Nature, the magazine, Nature sent it to referees, the referees said, well, we're not sure, but it looks like they did, the, did it right, publish it, and let's see what the rest of the world sees. And now people are arguing whether they did it right or not. This doesn't mean that, you know, the church was not involved in terms of people. I've got little squares here indicating in this particular, uh, I actually pulled this at random off of our collection of the Philosophical Transactions in Rome, September 1736. And the people who are publishing are an MD, a minor nobleman, a foreigner, German, a sea captain, a reverend, a minor nobleman, and a lawyer. Dr. Davidian, I'm sorry, Dr. Davidian, and not a lawyer. So, okay, one of the people publishing happens to be a reverend. Who else in the 18th century has the education and the free time to do science? Not surprising. But the church itself is not involved in the science directly until the Vatican Observatory is established in 1891. And here's the development up to Laudato Si. The Pope gives the, the, the Vatican Observatory, the money, the opportunity to do science, to make the church look good so that people can see that we like science. By the early 20th century, Pius XI is saying, well, you know, astronomy not only makes us look good, but it makes you look at the universe and see, gee, how nice God is, and it will lead you to do prayer. But it's still in the service of and subservient to the uses of the church. Uh, Pius XII has this marvelous phrase that <clears throat> the, by the universe, we climb a ladder on our way to God. This is actually Pius XII at the telescope that he paid for personally out of his family money that he gave to the Vatican Observatory. It's saying that, okay, the universe itself and the study of the universe can lead you to God, not just lead you to prayer, but actually lead you to God. It's a kind of prayer. It's really not until you get to John Paul II that you have a sense of the church recognizing astronomy and the knowledge and truth that comes from astronomy as an equal. Each has something to teach the other. And this phrase that, you know, astronomy can save religion from superstition and religion can save astronomy from false absolutes. The idea that this is the best explanation at the moment, but it's not the final explanation. That's in a letter that JP2 wrote to the director of the Vatican Observatory. And these are the members of the observatory at the time, me back when I had a red beard, as I say. Pope Francis has taken that a step further. This was when he was meeting with their summer school class and he reminds the students that we do astronomy. We do astronomy for the joy that it brings us, for the human emotions. It's not just to be right or wrong, but because we experience a joy in the act of doing the astronomy. And this interconnection between the human and the science is really what Laudato Si is about. Because first of all, just to remind you that climate change has been around for a while, that was you know, where I was in the 60s and where Carl Sagan was in the 60s, talking about the importance of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus. But in 1956, there's an article, including the phrase, the greenhouse in the New York Times, referencing work going back to 1861 by Tyndall. And in case you don't remember Tyndall, he was an Irishman, a Protestant. He was the one who explained how the heat in the atmosphere is absorption of infrared radiation. 
and how you know absorbers in the atmosphere could cause that. He was also a vehement opponent of Irish home rule because putting the non-Catholic mi minority under the dominion of the priestly horde would be an unspeakable crime. Well, human beings, scientists are human beings, just as Galileo could be arrogant, but also important, just as Carl Sagan could be a media hound, and yet the one who inspired a new generation of astronomers. People are complicated. And it's as people are complicated that comes out of the Tao to see. It's not about ecology or climate change. It's how our own human temptations against econ economics and, and social justice have an effect in the way we understand the universe. I won't even go into the whole Jesuit thing behind it. But it's a reminder that everything we do in science and technology is colored by our human background, is colored by who we are as people. So to, to recap this modern view, science and faith can be bridged only if they're, you know, one side is brought up to the same level as the other. But it reminds us that we, as the scientists, are also creatures of the universe. The laws of physics explain the chemistry that works in our bodies, and the laws of right and wrong explain how we choose what we're going to study and how we're going to present it to other people. The problems of the Laudato Si are not just technical problems, but problems of good and evil, which means they're never going to go away. We're not going to ever come up with a system so perfect that we don't have to worry about being good anymore, which is what T.S. Eliot writes in this marvelous bit of poetry. I end there to let you know that uh, this marvelous combination of astronomy and the reasons why we do astronomy is something we talk about a lot in a website called Sacred Space Astronomy. And I hope if you're interested, you have a chance to check out our website and maybe even join in the conversation. Thanks a whole lot to everybody. And I think I got through it in 30 minutes. Brother Guy, thank you very much for that uh, intricate talk. I have a few questions of my own. Uh, um, I'll now hand you over to uh, Linda and Declan. Well, there's a question from John Bowen, and he says, does the church have a position on the commercial exploitation of the moon and planets, i.e. Mars? Um, it's an interesting and uh, tricky thing to answer because absolutely we're worried about social injustice and the uh, Vatican is a, you know, a supporter of the Treaty on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, which says that there should not be, you know, that, that the resources of space are for all humankind. It's more complicated than that because we are also trying to be a neutral ground where the different players can speak about this. Two years ago was the 50th anniversary of the Treaty on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and um, a meeting that the United Nations held on exploitation well, 50 years ago, of course, everyone was happy to say, oh yes, the you know, outer space belongs to everyone because frankly, nobody could get there except the Russians and the, and the Americans. That's not the case anymore. At the Vatican Observatory in March of 2018, we were the neutral ground where 35 representatives, different stakeholders, including the scientists, uh, UN people and uh, commercial people got together to just hear each other out and discuss what the issues were before a very big meeting was held on this in Vienna that summer. And it was fascinating, the things I learned. Uh, for instance, 75 nations now have government offices for the uses of outer space. And you're thinking, oh no, 75. But there are actually 20 different entities at the moment who are capable of putting things in Earth orbit. But even if you're a nation like Kenya, your students can be building a, a CubeSat that the Europeans might launch, and your government is getting data about remote parts from orbiting spacecraft. Maybe that's being sold to you by a commercial entity. Maybe it's being given to you by a government entity, but you know, the government of, of you know, the Russians or the Chinese or whoever that are giving you the information they're going to want something in return. It's become a much more complicated uh, situation. I was the, the Vatican's representative. I read the document that the Vatican you know, wanted to say, which was basically peace is good, space is good. Let's not 
uh, certainly let's not put military forces in space, but also let's recognize that it is a resource for all human beings. This is an interesting thing, I think, for you guys who are Irish, because the places where the companies are being incorporated nowadays to exploit space tend to be small countries, small but well-educated countries. Um, the, 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 so, you know, the, the <clears throat> Arab countries are getting involved in this. Um, Luxembourg is a headquarters for a lot of this work. The Isle of Man is actually the place where a lot of these corporations are incorporated. Just because you think, well, we're a small country, we're not going to be involved. It may be precisely because you're a small country that people are going to want to exploit the interesting and political situation that you're in. And as at the end of the day, there is no one system that will guarantee that we won't have a problem. We're always going to have problems because we're human beings. It's the nature of who we are. But what we need to have are a set of laws that everybody buys into. Because if everybody is launching a constellation of 10,000 satellites, nobody's going to make enough money to pay for it. If everybody's launching satellites without worrying about where the satellites are going, they're going to wind up colliding with each other, creating debris, and making that part of low Earth orbit useless for everyone. If you're going to spend a lot of money to get resources or data and try to bring it back to Earth and someone else goes out there and physically, or physically takes it from you, not only do you lose it, but your investors have lost it. So if you haven't come up with a way of working out who are the policemen of space, who enforces the laws, then you're not going to get people willing to invest in your corporation. We're right at the beginning. It's pretty much the Wild West up there, but it can't last that way for long because it's to nobody's advantage. And what we hope to be at the Vatican is a neutral ground where people can come together and talk about the issues that everybody's facing. Um, Bill Cavan has a question. Who followed Galileo and was he or she as controversial? Oh yeah, um, certainly Galileo had a wide number of people who followed on his science in some in agreement, some in disagreement. Uh, a couple of names that immediately come to mind would be Kepler. Kepler wrote books that he sent to Galileo that Galileo never read. In part because Kepler wrote this really turgid Latin, and one of the reasons Galileo dropped out of school is he wasn't that well, that good in Latin. Um, Kepler had this idea of elliptical orbits. Galileo never accepted that. Kepler had a better idea of how optics works. Galileo never wanted to admit he didn't know how the telescope worked. There were a couple of Jesuits at that time, Christoph Scheiner, who did better observations and explained the sun better than Galileo. And uh, um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Riccioli, who wrote a marvelous book that, you know, pre you know, he came up with the map of the moon that everybody uses now, with all the names that everybody uses. And yet they both rejected the Copernican system for the good scientific reason that they couldn't get around the, uh, well, if the stars are the same as our sun, but look like little disks in the telescope, they must be really close. And if they're really close, how come we don't see relative motions? It wasn't until Newton, you know, a generation later, that people finally understood how to get around that Newton's laws and eventually the laws of optics, which explained why bigger telescopes give you smaller circles. Oh, maybe then that's something to do with the telescope, but not something to do with the star. But it took a while because science is like that. It's a random walk. Sometimes you get things half right and half wrong. Um, Mike has a question there. Does the Vatican participate with international space agencies on projects? And what footing would these relationships be on? The Vatican Observatory is, a support, is supported by the Vatican City State. And, you know, the Vatican City State is a pretty dinky organization. Its annual budget is less than the annual budget of, you know, two major movies. Uh, you know, Hollywood, it, it, the, the joke is it costs more money to make a movie about going to Mars than it would actually cost to send a spacecraft to Mars. But we do have members of the Vatican Observatory who are participating in spacecraft missions. Um, right now, there's one of our guys, uh, Richard D'Souza, who's got Hubble time to do observing for his project. 
there is a uh, brother, Bob Mackey, who took over for me as the curator of meteorites, who is one of the uh, scientists on the Lucy mission, which is going to be launched in October, 2021 to go to a Trojan asteroid. And certainly we have participated, uh, whether it's paid or unpaid uh, principal investigators in other missions and other projects supported by NASA, but they're done on a one-to-one -one basis. Me personally on that mission, not the Vatican Observatory or the Vatican being part of that mission. So that's, that's how that happens. Sorry, I see one there from Colum as well. Does the Catholic Church have any position on whether humanity should or shouldn't contact extra ter terrestrial civilizations if they do exist? The short answer is no, it doesn't have any position on that, but I'll give a little bit longer of an answer to that. Now that I've worked at the Vatican 25 years, the Vatican is itself a really small organization. It's about the size of a big city high school. You know, maybe a thousand people who are there at any given day doing the jobs of running an organization of 1.2 billion people. So that's why you've got bishops sort of pretty much doing their own thing all around the world, because there's not enough people to even keep track of what's going on in each of these dioceses. It means you don't have people sitting in rooms trying to come up with official positions on items you know, as esoteric as whether or not there you know, should be contact with extraterrestrials. The question is not as silly as it sounds not because I think we're going to find extraterrestrials or get in touch with them anytime soon. But as I argue in, in you know, the book, I, my colleague and I wrote called, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? Which, <laughs> conveniently enough, I've got a copy of here so I can show you the cover. <clears throat> Such a good book, you should buy two copies. The uh, question causes you to think in a bigger perspective. What does it mean to be a member of creation that is able to reflect on itself? Through you and me, the universe can recognize that it exists. And that may be true of other creatures in other planets, in other places, in other times. And we think they're going to be due, you know, subject to the same laws of physics and chemistry. So why not the same laws of right and wrong? the same questions that philosophers never get tired of asking because a philosophical question is not like a science question. A science question, you solve it, you put it in the book, you move on. A philosophical question is one that you keep coming back to and contemplating and thinking and recognizing aspects to it that you didn't know and wondering about other possible civilizations is a great way to ask yourself, what does civilization mean? To, to go to the, the question, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? Well, what's the point of baptism? What is baptism all about? Would it even apply? And if it does, what does that tell us about what it's supposed to be? What is it supposed to mean? And those are great questions to ask. So the questions that it provokes are far more interesting than any of the answers that I can come up with. Um, this is from John Flannery. Is the VATT operational at the moment? in Arizona, or are there restrictions on use during to the current pandemic? The answer is yes and yes. <laughs> uh, the, the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope is one of three telescopes on Mount Graham. And the other two are a large uh, 10 meter microwave telescope that was part of the network of telescopes that was used to get the shadow of the black hole, the Advent Horizon Telescope, and the large binocular telescope. So we're definitely the junior partner but we're under the same rules that everybody works on. And because of the need to make sure that there's no transmission of the virus, for a while they shut the telescopes down from the middle of March until the end of May, and then worked out a protocol. We have a number of people who are qualified to use our telescopes by themselves. Or if you have a team of people who are living in the same bubble, and they want to go up together, a husband and wife team, for instance. So we have opened, uh, we opened at the end of uh, May and worked until the middle of July when the monsoon season came, and then in September opened up again. And so the telescope is in use right now. Father Richard Boyle, 
is up at the telescope. He's an expert at it. He's working by himself and he's collecting data. So the telescope is in operation. But it meant that some of the people who had granted telescope time, we had to say, sorry, you know, there's, you need someone who has been checked out to be able to run the telescope by yourself, not with a second person there. It's a complicated telescope and you really don't want uh, an inexperienced person running the entire thing. To inexperienced people, it's not so bad as long as they've both been trained, they can help each other. So those are the restrictions that we have on the use of it. Uh, yes, brother. I actually, there are a couple of questions I'd like to ask, but I don't suppose there'll be time for both of them. One would have been about Galileo. But can I go right to the very end of your talk, brother Guy? And I, I didn't quite follow what you had to say about the relationship between science and good and evil. I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that there should be a relationship, but I didn't quite fathom what you thought that relationship should be. Well, because I, I didn't tell it, because I was, you know, myself running short of time, and that would be another hour-long talk. The only point I was making here is that we have to recognize that science and the technology that comes from science is human, and regardless of how innocent we think it's going to be, there will always be a moral dimension. And let me give you a couple of examples. What is more passive than you know building a telescope and looking at the sky? Well, there's the moral dimension when you demand to your neighbor, turn off your light, because I want to look at the sky, and your neighbor is going to say, it's my light and it's my property, who the heck are you? There's a moral issue. It's a moral issue if you're building a telescope on land that uh, has traditionally belonged to indigenous people. How do you handle that? And the answer is not easy. It's not, oh, well, you let them say this, or you'll, no, you don't, because our telescope in Arizona, there are 18 different tribes who are arguing among themselves, you know, who has the right to make the, the claim that you can use this or not use it. You wind up getting involved in human issues that, uh, are not easily to, easily adjudicated. You, you know, exploiting space is going to involve temptations to good and evil. And the deeper issue, I mean, what you choose to, to study and how you choose to study it will affect the questions that get asked and the answers that a referee or an editor of a journal will think are worthy of publishing. The sorts of the sorts of things that got people Nobel Prizes 100 years ago in physics, people today would look at and say, why did you get the prize? What, that wasn't anything. Well, at the time, maybe it was something, and we have a very different view of how important it was or wasn't. It means that we have to remember at the end of the day, science is not something I do by myself. I may be alone in front of the computer screen, but if I didn't have a community of other scientists, I wouldn't have anybody to tell what I had done. I wouldn't have their input into what they thought was interesting, that maybe I can be part of the conversation. It's why astronomy clubs, like your club, are so important. Because I got my little telescope and I can go out and look at a couple of things that I wanna look at. But I had no idea what to look at with my telescope until I had a friend who had been part of a club who was able to tell me, here is something that I think you might like. And this is my friend, Dan Davis. You know, we wrote that book, Tour and Left at Orion together. Having a community of people is so important. Even though your club is probably, uh, dare I say, has had its share of internal politics and somebody being mad at somebody else. And, and if it hasn't happened, it will because we're human beings. But at the end of the day, it's worth putting up with because it's only by talking to each other that we are reminded why we wanted to do this in the first place, why we find joy in what we do. And to be inspired to do new things and to learn how to do new things that we might never have done on our own. So it's that human aspect, not just right and wrong, but the, the, the search for beauty, the search for fun, the search for joy, all of which, you know, from my caller's point of view, I say is the presence of God. 
you don't have to be a believer to, to experience beauty and joy, that's for sure. Those are the reasons why we do what we do, why we go outside when it's cold and when you could be, you know, indoors having another sandwich and why we'd rather be outside in a good, dark, cold night. It's because we have a community of people who have supported us and reminded us of just how wonderful this stuff is. Brother Guy, let me thank you on behalf of Cork Astronomy Club and everyone here tonight for a most thought-provoking talk and series of answers to those questions. <laughs> guys, guys, there was one thing I wanted to say about Galileo. I, I was very interested to hear you say that um, there was some dubiety over what exactly Galileo was uh, um, severely suspected of heresy for. But surely it's quite simple. He said that the uh, earth went round the sun, contrary to the book of Joshua, where it says that the sun stood still while Joshua slaughtered the Edomites or whoever it happened to be. Right. I mean, isn't that it? What, what more to it than well, that? But he had been saying that for 20 years, and uh, Cardinal Bellarmine himself said, if you can demonstrate it, then that's fine. We just have to figure out a different way of understanding yeah. Scripture. Yeah. They were used to that. The idea of, you know, only understanding scripture word for word the way it was written yeah. was a Protestant idea. And so it was not all of that, uh, you know, <clears throat> as one of the other cardinals had famously put it, you know, scripture tells us, tells us how to go to heaven, not, to, not how the heavens go. So that was, oh, I thought that was Galileo said no, that. Galileo, did, Galileo quoted a friend of his who was a cardinal yeah. who said that. Ah, I get it, I get it, yeah. And um, he could have gotten away with that. It was, um, that wasn't really the issue. But what was the issue? Well, that's where the historians start arguing with each other. And um, it was clear that they wanted to get him on something for some reason. But exactly what and exactly why people have been arguing about. I mean, someone else, I, I just was reading the comments here about, uh, you know, what an idiot uh, Galileo was. You couldn't read him as an idiot or as a hero. He was both. He was a human being. Um, yes. Lots of people could have looked at the moon, but only he had the artist's view to recognize that he was looking at mountains from above looking down. A point of view of mountains that no one had ever had before. And yet he knew what he was looking at because he had the imagination. Um, his proofs for the motion of the earth were all wrong, but he was right. The earth was moving. And the fact of the matter was that uh, he was saying this long before he even had a telescope. His insights were correct, even though he was not always good at um, being able to demonstrate it in a way that he would convince other people. Um, he was somebody who made lots of enemies, but also passionately made friends, including clergy, who were on his side, who were willing to risk their careers to support him. He's a complicated guy, very complicated guy. I know, and until you said it just now, it, it had never occurred to me that in Galileo's day, never, no one had ever seen a mountain from on top. That, that's very interesting, yes. Very insightful of him. And uh, he, he wrote that... Uh, dialogue didn't he yeah. where he 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 cast the pope in the role of simplicius or something wasn't that it Except the fool of the, simplicius the fool was, of the trio. yeah but simplicius was a time honored position in philosophical discussions it's not to yeah. say that he was a simpleton it was to say that this was the pure of heart this is the man who you know could see beyond the arguments into, into deeper matters. On the other hand, he did make the guy look something like a simpleton. And there are some people who say that Pope Urban, who was the Pope involved, it is from his name that the word Urbane came because he was a very sophisticated, worldly sort of fellow, didn't like being cast this way. Pope Urban, on the other hand, had the degree in the stuff that Galileo never had. Complicated world. Yeah. Surely um, anyone who challenges the establishment is going to get into trouble, even if you go down to like Thomas Harrison, who invented or modified the chronometer 
it took him something like 50 years mm -hmm. to get his reward in the end. They just wouldn't accept new thinking. And yet, sometimes there's a lot of new thinking that you don't want to accept because it's nonsense. 99% of the, 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 the radical new ideas, I get them every week by email. When I was younger, there used to be people who would write on very thin onion skin paper with, you know, all in caps. Now they send me emails all in caps. And it's hard to tell ahead of time what's an idea worth pursuing and what's an idea, unless this is someone who's been part of the conversation. But by being part of the conversation, you're also part of that evil establishment. It's not easy. It's never easy to come up with these things. And nobody's ever 100% right. Galileo got lots of things wrong, but he was right on the big thing at the end. I'd like to thank you too, Brother Guy, for um, um, uh, telling everybody to go out in the cold and do a bit of observing for the joy of it. Something we greatly appreciate here in Cork. At the end of the day, that's why you do it. Yeah, that's it. And I, I grew up in Michigan, with, whose weather in the wintertime is probably almost as bad as that in Ireland. And it makes the clear days all the more special. It means when you get one of those crystal clear moments, you don't dare waste it. But of course, professional astronomers no longer do that, do they? They just stare at computer screens or print out some data. It's even worse than that. Nowadays, a lot of the big telescopes, you write to them once you get the time, you say, look at this at that time. And once you've, you know, and you're in a queue. And once the telescope gets to your observation, they'll take the data and then email it to you. So you're not even there. You're not even looking at the, the yeah. screen as it's happening. It's a job. And that means that you're doing something very different. Um, it's like the difference between being the captain of a, you know, a, a thousand foot uh, t oil tanker and having a dinghy that you go sailing on. They're both boats in the water, but uh, I wouldn't want to steer the tanker the way I steer my dinghy. But let's face it, the dinghy's a whole lot more fun. I just want to say how much I wish I could be in Cork. I've been there. I've got friends there. I've got friends among the people here. And uh, I wish I could be with you in person. Yeah, yeah let, 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 let's hope we'll be able to welcome you in yes. person again in the not too distant right. future. Well, I was scheduled to be in the, uh, the, the Dark Sky group uh, site in Mayo last year and this year, and both of those didn't happen. Yeah. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. See you then. Okay. I'm going to have to be on my way then. Thanks a whole Thank, lot for having thank me. Thank you again. Thanks very much, brother. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you.